Good afternoon again in the name of Jesus. It's the 1st of July now. How about that? Start of the second half of 2013 here at the Mid-Year Training School in Shiloh Apostolic Center, Training Center. And uh, we've, we've already had a wonderful beginning on Saturday and then a wonderful time of fellowship. I know we did at Shiloh on Sunday, just a really rich time. And uh, so we've come to this session, which is called Describe the House to the House. What is it? Describe the house to the house. So maybe you can look at your neighbor and you can say, I'm going to tell the house to you, the house. <laughs> so let's look in Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 10. Hallelujah. Simo is very excited about Ezekiel. I told him he looks like Ezekiel. Ezekiel 43 verse 10. Ezekiel 43 verse 10 says, Son of man, describe... See, I've got the New King James Version, but the New King James Version, I'll read it as this and then I'll tell you what it really says. <laughs> Son of man, describe the temple to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. Now, in the King James Version, which actually translate this, translates this verse a bit better, it's literally, describe the house to the house of Israel. The Hebrew word is the word bayit. Say bayit. Yeah, bayit is the word for house. Or, you know, it's where we get in English, beth. Bethel means house of God. Bethlehem means house of bread. It's the beth word. Bayit in Hebrew, which means house. And so... Um, the New King James Version translators put the word temple in there, but that's not a good description because God, God actually lives in a house. He, he's not a temple person. You know, false gods dwell in temples. Idols dwell in temples, but God dwells in a house because he's a, he's a father. He, likes it. he wants to have a house. Fathers want a house, but false gods want a temple. And so we are to describe the house to the house of Israel. In other words, describing the house of God or the dwelling place of God to the people of God. Amen. And so in, to, in, in our context of the New Testament, we want to see what is the house of God in the New Testament? 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15 tells us what the house of God is. The Apostle Paul, in writing to Timothy, tells him, If I am delayed... I am writing to you so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is, see, Paul even gives us the definition. What is the house of God? He says, which is the house of, the house of God, which is the church of the living God. So what is the house of God? The scriptures cannot be any clearer that it's actually the church of the living God. Hallelujah. So the house of God is not the building that you worship in. The house of God is not the place down the road where you meet on a Sunday. The house of God is the church of the living God and the church is made up of you and I together. Believers in Jesus. Amen. And it says that the church, the house of God is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth or the pillar and the mainstay, the foundation of the truth. So the house of God in the earth, which is the church, is meant to be the place where anybody on the earth can actually find reality, truth, and veracity, sincerity, integrity, and accuracy of who God is. That's what God's intention is. Amen. So he wants a house where people can find truth, reality. And so Ezekiel was told in this verse that his job as a prophet was actually to describe the house of God to the house of Israel, the people of God. What an awesome commission. And really that is the apostolic prophetic commission of the New Testament also is to actually explain or describe the house of God to the house, the people of God. Amen. The house of Israel there meaning the people of God. 
Amen. A true Israelite is one who is one inwardly. Amen. Is one who actually has had a transformation from Jacob to Israel. <laughs> Amen. And so that's the true house of Israel. If you're a Gentile and, and you've come near by the blood of Christ, it says you are now a partaker of the commonwealth of Israel. You are of the house of Israel. Hallelujah. And so we are to describe the house to the house of Israel. But we want to look in context here because Ezekiel 43 begins at verse 1. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and that was verse 10. So we want to get the what is happening here. What has God been saying leading up to this that's giving us the understanding of the house of God? And this chapter is so full of wonderful things to understand about the house of God and about God's eternal purpose. So in verse 1, uh, it says, Afterward, he brought me to the gate, to the gate that faces toward the east. In verse 2, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. Wow. So he, he brought me to the gate that faces east. Back a little bit, if you look in Ezekiel chapter 10, because this is actually, Ezekiel now is explaining a return of the glory, because the glory in Ezekiel chapter 10 had left the former house. That, that former house in, the, in, the, in Ezekiel's time, that former house that was being referred to was actually the temple or the house that Solomon had built for God. And Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian armies had come in and they had actually destroyed that house. And Ezekiel was actually a priest of God who was with the people of God in exile in Babylon. And so he was actually seeing in a vision the glory departing from that house that was now destroyed. And so in Ezekiel chapter 10 and verse 18, it says, this is what he saw. He said, Then the glory of Yahweh the Eternal One departed from the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels were beside them, and they stood at the door of the east gate of Yahweh's house. So the place where God left the house was also through the east gate. You know, when God gave Moses the tabernacle, the gate that people were to come in was the east gate. That was the entryway. That was the way to come in. And that was also the way, I guess, to go out. <laughs> Amen. And so now God is coming again, on, but this is in the context of a new house. Ezekiel has started to see from Ezekiel chapter 40 all the way to the end of the chapter is the, is the description of a new house, a new dwelling place for God. The measurements are different to the one that Solomon built. The, the things that are described, there's differences there. So God is actually saying that that, that, old, that one that Solomon built is destroyed, but there's a new house and God is coming into that new house. Interesting to see, I just think as well, that the glory departed when the people of God were taken to exile in Babylon. So where did the glory go? He stayed with his people. Isn't that wonderful? He judged his people and even, to, even allowed his own house to be destroyed, but he went into Babylon with his people. He actually went with them into exile. He never left them. When Haggai, when Haggai was, was prophesying in those days, he says, My spirit remains with you as I covenanted with you. God never left them. Isn't that a wonderful thing about God? That even when he was judging his people, he still stayed with them in the midst of his own judgment. Isn't God wonderful? Counselor, <laughs> mighty God. Hallelujah. And so the glory was coming back. It's interesting too in the garden in Genesis 3 verse 24 that when the man got thrown out of the garden, it was actually that the garden, even at the beginning, the, the gate or the way into the garden was in Eden facing eastward. <laughs> so God always had something about east, that that's the way to come in and there was a flaming sword and cherubim guarding the way to the tree of life. So even in that beginning place where God was dwelling with man after sin, the way was to come in through the east. The sun rises in the east. Amen. So they were to come in the east gate. And then it says, back in Ezekiel 43, Behold, the glory of the God of Israel came 
from the way of the east. Hallelujah. And so what is this glory? We will, Paul was looking in the last session a little bit at the glory. And so we want to see something about this glory um, a, a bit more. I'll, I'll share it a bit more out of the Old Testament. In, in Isaiah chapter 60, if you have a Spirit-filled life Bible, there's a wonderful word wealth on the word for glory in the word in Hebrew. Um, yeah, you could do. That would be good because I'll be talking about it. So while Rhoda's actually going to find it on the word wealth on the, on the computer there. So the word for glory is the word kavod. Say kavod. And it, this, is what the, it's, this is what the word wealth in the New King James Spiritual Life Bible says. It means weightiness. That which is substantial. Substance, you know, something that is weighty, that, is, that has got, uh, what's another word, like meat in it. <laughs> it's heavy. It's a heaviness. It's glory, honor, splendor, power, wealth, authority, magnificence, fame, dignity, riches, and excellency. Isn't that an awesome description? So when it says that the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of east of the of the east, the weightiness, the substance, the heaviness, the honor, the splendor, the power, the wealth, the authority, the magnificence, fame, dignity, riches, and excellency of the God of Israel came. Wow. Isn't that wonderful to think about? That's, this is the full complement of God. This is God in all of who he is. You know, in the New Testament, Paul, the Apostle Paul, writes many times in describing it, saying the riches of his glory. Because the glory has the idea of the riches, the richness. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The riches of the glory. He'll supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. Because the glory has to do with the wealth and the substance of God. If someone's a wealthy person, sometimes we even say they're a man of substance. Meaning that they have a lot of... They have a lot backing them. They have a lot behind them, usually thinking in terms of wealth in some way. But even when we know that there is someone who is of a high standard of moral character, we say that is a person of substance because they're principled. They don't go on what makes them popular. They go on what makes them them. They actually stay true to their integrity and character. And so God is a God of glory. Amen. He's a God of substance. And it's the glory of the God of Israel that came from the way of the east. And so the glory, let's have a little bit more of a search around. What is the glory? Look in Ezekiel chapter 11 and verse 23. Because is the glory of God some nebulous sort of thing? Is the glory a thing? <laughs> or is it something else? It says, and the glory of Yahweh went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain. So the glory went up and the glory stood. <laughs> so what do we think? What do, we, what do you think about the glory? The glory must be someone. I've never seen something, something just decide to move and stand. <laughs> but the glory went up and the, on a mountain and the glory stood there. Wow, so who is this glory? What is this glory? Hallelujah. And that was on the east side of the city. Amen. And so some of the verses that even Paul said, which so we'll just put them as, as references, Hebrews 1 verse 3 is so clear, talking about the Son of God, saying that he is the brightness of his glory. He is the brightness of glory. So who is the glory? It's the Son of God. Amen. It's Jesus. Hallelujah. And then in, in um, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, it says that we see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So how do we see the glory? It's in the face of Jesus Christ. So the glory is emanating from Jesus the Christ. And let's have a look in Exodus chapter 34 to see some reality of that glory, the 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 attributes, the what makes the glory the glory. Because Moses had said, please show me your glory. And so this is how God answered in verse 5 of chapter 34. 
It says, Now Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. And Yahweh passed before him and proclaimed Yahweh, which means the eternal one, I am. So literally, I am, I am God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Here's a sevenfold, if not eight, fold understanding of the glory. It's mercy. It's grace. It's long-suffering. You know what long-suffering in the Hebrew is? It literally means a long nose. <laughs> because it can also be translated slow to anger. And the word for anger in the Hebrew is the flaring of your nostrils. You know when you're angry? <laughs> But when God's slow to anger, it means he has a long nose. It takes a while for that breath to get the flare. <laughs> so he's long-suffering, amen. He bears with us without a short fuse. And he's abounding in goodness. So the intrinsic nature of God is good. We were talking in our house this morning about how, we, you know, the circumstances around us can be all we can have all types of things happening that we could maybe say, God, why are you allowing this? Why are you doing this? But we need to know that the intrinsic nature of God is good. Even when bad things may be happening, that does not change the reality that God is good. He actually is what good is. Amen? So he's, abound he's not only just good, but he's abounding in goodness. He's abounding in truth. Aren't these wonderful things? This is the glory. This is the glory of the God of Israel that was coming by from the way of the east. Oh, hallelujah. This was the glory that was walking. Mercy, grace, long-suffering, abounding in goodness, abounding in truth, was standing and moving. Hallelujah. And it says that he keeps mercy for thousands. So keeps mercy is a term of meaning he's a covenant-keeping God. He keeps his mercy for thousands. Amen. So he's faithful to keep covenant. He never forsakes a promise that he's made. And seventh one, he forgives iniquity, transgression and sin. So he's forgiving. And sometimes people, they, they tend to think, you know, God in the Old Testament, he was angry. In the New Testament, he got okay. He got happy. <laughs> <laughs> this is how God revealed himself to Moses. Look at this. When Moses said, please show me your glory, this is what God did. He said, I am, I am God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness, abounding in truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. And the eighth one is, but by no means clearing the guilty. He's just. If people remain unrepentant, he will not just gloss over it, but he will punish the iniquity because that is what is right. So God is right in everything he does. He is just. He doesn't clear the guilty. There must be an atonement that must be accepted by a guilty person. So this is the fullness of the glory. This is the glory of the God of Israel coming into this house that has been prepared for him. Hallelujah. Let's go back to Ezekiel 43 because this is important then because it says then later that the earth shone with his glory. So did you know, this is still in verse 2, that it's God's plan for the earth to shine with this glory. God wants this glory to actually cause the earth to shine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The earth shone with that glory. And, you know, just as a note here, Romans 8, verse 18 to 21, just to have as a cross-reference here to see something of God's eternal purpose of the glory. It says that the, the sufferings that we are experiencing now are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in 
us in you. Look at your neighbour and say, that glory is to be revealed in you. (laughs) God wants to reveal mercy, grace, a long nose, goodness and truth. (laughs) Hallelujah. Mercy and and covenant-keeping forgiveness and righteousness, justice. He wants to reveal in you. Wow. And then it says that because of that, you see, it says that, that the whole of creation is actually groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God because the earth is wanting this glory to be revealed so that the earth can be delivered from its bondage to corruption. Wow. Amen. Let's go on to verse 3 of Ezekiel 43. So this is the glory of the God of Israel that's coming in. Verse 3 and 4 says, It was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when I came to destroy the city. The visions were like the vision which I saw by the river Chebar, and I fell on my face. And the glory of Yahweh came into the house by the way of the gate which faces toward the east. So the glory has come in. See, God wants to fill a house with the glory. Have a look in Exodus chapter 40 to see that it's always been God's intention to have a house, a place to dwell, a place for his glory to be revealed in the earth. And so from verse 33 to 35 of Ezekiel 40, Exodus, sorry, Exodus chapter 40, verse 33 to 35, we see what happened when Moses had finished building the tabernacle after he had completed it according to the instructions that God had given him to complete it. And it says, And he raised up the court all around the tabernacle and the altar, hung up the screen of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. He finished. He finished the work that God had given him to do and in building the tabernacle. And then it says, Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory, the kavod of Yahweh, filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting, because the cloud rested above it, and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. God always wants, God has always wanted to fill the house, a house for himself on the earth, with his glory. And just as a, another cross-reference, just in brackets, we won't go there, but in Second Chronicles 5, verse 13 and 14, you'll also see that after Solomon had finished building the house that God had told him to build through his father David, the same thing happened again. That as he dedicated that house, it was the glory, the kavod that came and filled that house. And in that time, it also said that the priests could not stand to minister in that house because there was no need for ministry anymore because the glory was filling the house. Amen. So there's going to come a time where there's no more need for ministry when the house is ready for the fullness of his glory. Hallelujah. You wanting to come to that time? Amen. Verse 5 of Ezekiel 43. Ezekiel 43, verse 5. It then says, The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of Yahweh filled the house. Ezekiel loves talking about this glory, doesn't he? (laughs) He saw the glory. Hallelujah. And so the Spirit lifted me up. Brethren, we need to be lifted up by the Spirit. He lifts me up into heavenly places and his banner over me is love. (laughs) He lifts us up. The Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, lifts us up into the heavenly places so that we can see these things. It was the Spirit of the Lord that lifted Ezekiel up to be able to see these things. In the book of Revelation, when John received the revelation, he said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and he showed me these things. So where do we need to be if we're going to see what God is doing? We need to be in the Spirit. 
Amen. And so Ezekiel said, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. What's the inner court? That was actually the most holy. That was the inner place. So the Spirit lifted him up and brought him right in to the inner court. Who wants to be brought right into the inner court? Hallelujah. And, you know, God wants to bring us to that place so that we can see clearly. Three compartments in that, in that tabernacle that God showed Moses to build. There was the outer court, the holy place, the most holy place. God wants to bring us in by the Spirit right all the way into the most holy place because it's from that place that we can see the glory. It's from that place we can see what the Father is doing. It's from that place that we can cooperate with what God wants us to do. The other places we can't see. Interesting, I was just thinking about Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark had three decks. There was only one window in the ark and it was at the very top. And so if you, were, if you had only come down to the bottom place of the ark, you would have been preserved in the judgment, but you would have had no idea what's going on. <laughs> even if you'd come to the second place, so even in the holy place, you would have been preserved in the judgment, but you still don't really know what's going on. It's only up in the third place, in that third heaven, in that realm of the, of the most holy place that you can see, wow, God, look what you're doing. Woo! <laughs> Hallelujah. And so God wants us up. He wants to lift us up so that we can look out of the window. Wow. And we can see the judgment even happening around us. A thousand might fall on our left, 10,000 on our right hand, but it will not come near us. We Only will, with our eyes will we see the judgment of the wicked. Wow. Hallelujah. God wants to bring us up to the third level of the ark. <laughs> Hallelujah. He wants to bring us un under maturity to see the glory. The Spirit lifted me up. In, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, it says that we have access by one Spirit to the Father. See, it's the Spirit who brings us in to the place of knowing the Father in the most holy place so that we can actually understand the deep things of God. You see, the house that God is building is a spiritual house. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. It's a spiritual house. It says that you as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Hallelujah. And so this spiritual house can only be understood by the Spirit. So we need to be in the Spirit. We need to be lifted up by the Spirit. To <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes? Okay. Yeah, well, that was powerful. <laughs> 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 all right. Is it all good? The Spirit, we need to be lifted up in the Spirit to be able to understand the spiritual house that God is building. You see, it's by revelation. Look at your neighbor and say, Revelation. Because it's only by revelation of the Spirit of God <laughs> that we will understand the things of God. I think it's 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13. Verse, yeah, it's around there. Verse, I think it's verse 12 and 13 that says it's, it's actually the Spirit of God that knows the deep things of God. And then it's the Spirit of God then who relates those deep things of God. It's verse 11 to 13. That it's the, the deep things that knows the things of God. No one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. And now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. You have an amazing richness in you if you have the spirit of God. You, you have the eternal God living inside of you, able to relate and release the deep things of God to you so you can understand what God is doing. And we need to learn how to tap into the spirit of the living God to understand these things, not to, not to try and grasp all the time with our mind and intellect like Paul was talking before, 
but to allow the word of truth to pierce to our conscience into the spiritual realm of us so that we can actually receive what God is doing by revelation. Hallelujah. And then it says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Or another, or another way it translates, but, or combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words, being able to express and relate the spiritual reality of what God is doing. Hallelujah. So this house that God is building is a spiritual house. It can only be understood by the Spirit. That's why Jesus got so excited when Peter got a revelation. Because in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16 to 18, after Jesus had said to his disciples, Who do you say that I am? I, the Son of Man, am. Peter said, You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. You see, that sort of revelation comes down from the third heaven. You can only know Jesus in that way if it's revealed by the Father to you, if it's revealed by his Spirit. And then Jesus was able to say, and I'm calling you Peter, which means a stone. And upon this rock, upon that revelation you received by the Spirit, I can now build my church. I can now build the house of God. Hallelujah. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Hallelujah. And so it's only by the Spirit. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 is, a, is an often quoted verse among even you know Pentecostal circles. <laughs> but we've got to understand what it's talking about. In Zechariah chapter 4, it's in the context of Zechariah prophesying and encouraging the people to, to be able to be building the house of God and not to be waylaid, but to recognize that Zerubbabel, the governor of that time, was the one charged with building the house and that they were not to rely on any military or political strength or any political ally even or anything like that, but they were to get busy about it by the Spirit, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says Yahweh of armies. He's the one who owns all the armies. Hallelujah. And so it's by the spirit. The spirit lifted me up into the inner court. And it's actually, it's by the spirit that we actually see the glory. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we've seen that verse a number of times already over this school. Amen. So it must be that God is really wanting to help us understand that it's actually by the Spirit of God unveiling our minds, the minds of our hearts, the understanding of our hearts. It's by the Spirit of the Lord unveiling that we behold the glory and the glory changes us Amen. into the same image so that we can reflect the glory in the earth. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let's go to Ezekiel 43, verse 6 and 7. Many other verses that we can go to to see lots of things. Hallelujah. Verse 6 and 7, this is wonderful now. It says, Then I heard him speaking to me from the temple or the house, while a man stood beside me. And he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne, and the place of the soles of my feet and where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel for a few years. Oh, you're good, you're reading. <laughs> Forever. Oh. So this is amazing. This, there's a three-fold understanding of the house of God here that, that God is teaching us. And, we, and this is in the context of him saying to Ezekiel, describe the house to the house. What is the house of God meant to be? Number one, it's the place of his throne. The house of God, which is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and ground of the truth, is the place of the throne of God. Wow. You need to meditate on that. Think about that. God's government comes from his house. God's kingdom rule 
the throne of God is actually revealed in a house, in God's house, which is the church of the living God. Have a look in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1. Isaiah 66, verse 1. Thus says Yahweh the Eternal One, Heaven is my throne. What's the throne of God? Heaven. But how can that be? Where are you at the moment? You're on earth. And the heaven, heaven is God's throne and the house that is on the earth is the place of God's throne. Are you putting the things together? <laughs> Hallelujah. Heaven is the throne of God. The house of God is on the earth and the house is the place of God's throne. Heaven and earth have met together in this house. See, God wants a house so that things in heaven can be joined with things on earth in Christ. Hallelujah. See, the house of God is the place of my throne. It's the place of the kingdom of heaven being revealed. In Genesis chapter 28, in verse 12 and in verse 17, Jacob had a dream. And in verse 12 of Genesis 28, that dream that Jacob had, Jacob said, I saw a ladder set up on the earth and its top reached into heaven. And I saw Yahweh standing at the top of the ladder. Hallelujah. And then in verse 17, Jacob, in his understanding of that dream, the revelation that he got, he actually said, oh, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Wow. Jacob saw something set up on the earth that's top reached into heaven. He saw angels of God ascending and descending on that ladder. And then he said, this is the house of God. This is the dwelling place of God. It's something that is set up on the earth but is connected into heaven. Wow. So the house of God is to be such a place. And angels are ascending and descending. So the will of God in heaven is coming down onto the earth in the house. Hallelujah. So this is the house of God. The house of God is on earth and the throne is in it. In Ezekiel chapter 47, in verse 1, after seeing more things about this house, Ezekiel then said, Then he brought me back to the door of the house. And there was water flowing from under the threshold of the house toward the east. For the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. And then it says about that river in verse 7, When I returned there along the bank of the river were many trees on one side and the other. And it, and it says in, later on in another place, When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the rivers go will live. So there's a river, there's, a, there's waters that are coming from this house. And in Revelation chapter 22, verse 1, it tells us where the waters are coming from. It says in Revelation 22, verse 1, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Where is the throne? It's in the house. The house of God is the place of God's throne. And from that throne comes a river. And that river is pure. It's clear as crystal. And in the middle of its street, in verse 2 of Revelation 22, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So out of this house that God is building, that God is going to indwell with his glory, out of this house in which the throne of God is in the midst of is a river that is bringing healing to the nations. Can you look at your neighbor and say, you are part of this house? <laughs> the throne is in the midst of us. Hallelujah. And so there's many things that we could, you could see there as well 
In verse 3, it says, There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. So do you know in the house of God, there's meant to be no curse? Because wherever the throne of God is, there is no curse. So Simo was saying yesterday in, in the Shiloh meeting that he believes that that in these days there's going to be areas and places around the earth that are going to be functioning fully in the kingdom of heaven and there'll be restoration and, and all that you know healing all around those places. Well, it must be true because the house of God is the place of God's throne and where the throne is, there's no more curse. The curse is removed. Hallelujah. So there's only blessing being released. And it says that, In that place around the throne, his servants shall serve him and they shall see his face. Hallelujah. So in the house of God, there's revelation of the face of God. We see him as he is. We see his glory in the house of God because his throne is in the midst. And it says that his name shall be on their foreheads and there shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun for the Lord God gives them light. So the house of God is meant to be a place of illumination, revelation, understanding, learning the ways of God. And they shall reign forever and ever. See, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, it says that we have been raised up to be seated together with Christ in the heavenly places. So that throne is in the midst of the house. Just for for some references, It says about the throne, and it would be a good study to actually do the throne because there's some wonderful things. In Psalm 89 verse 14, just go through these quickly, it says righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. So the house of God is meant to be an expression of the righteousness and justice of the living God because that's the foundation of his throne. In in Psalm 45 verse 6, it says your throne, O God, is forever. So the throne that is established in the midst of the house of God is an eternal throne. It's forever. And in Jeremiah 17 verse 12, it says, A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. You see, the throne is where God always wanted us to live. (laughs) It's the place of our sanctuary. And it's a glorious high throne. And it's from the beginning. It's always been there because God has always wanted to put his throne in the midst of a people who are his people, his house. Amen. So back in Ezekiel 43, the second aspect of the house that Ezekiel describes there is he says it's the place for the soles of God's feet. You know, God likes to walk around in his house. (laughs) He likes to put his feet down in the house. And so going on from that, Isaiah 66 verse 1, that verse, it says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Wow. So that heavenly throne has an earthly footstool. Isn't that wonderful? And so in the house of God, God has a place for his feet. He wants to walk on the earth with you. So in 1 Chronicles chapter 28 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 2. 1 Chronicles 28, verse 2. This is when David was giving Solomon the plans. It says, Then King David rose to his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of Yahweh and for the footstool of our God and had made preparations to build it. See, David knew that the house that was to be built was to be a place of rest for God and was also to be a footstool for his feet. So what does the footstool even, what does that mean? On Psalm 110 verse 1, in Psalm 110 verse 1 it says, Yahweh said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So the footstool of God is actually on his enemies. Hallelujah. Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. And you see, he makes his enemies a footstool. I heard someone saying recently that the way, the way through, you see, when we get lifted up into heavenly places, we get lifted up far above principality and power. 
And so when we are in the place of his throne, then the enemy is under our feet while we walk on the earth. Hallelujah. And so this, the house of God becomes the place for the footstool of our God, a place where all the enemies are placed, uh, uh, made a footstool for his feet. And, you know, with, with a footstool, what do you do with a footstool with your feet? You rest your feet on there. So there's a rest. Even over our enemies, there's a rest. And God has a rest with his feet on the enemy. In Joshua chapter 10, in verse 24 and 25, Joshua was taking the land. And when he was taking the land, he defeated a few kings that were in the land before there because God had given them the land. And in Joshua 10, verse 24 and 25, it says, So it was when they brought out those kings to Joshua that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said to the captains of the men of war who went with him, Come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. Hallelujah. And they drew near and they put their feet on their necks. And then Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For thus Yahweh will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. So the house of God is a place in which all of God's enemies are made a footstool. So the house of God is a victorious house. The house of God is not a place looking for a rapture out of tribulation. The house of God is a place that is looking to put the enemies under the feet. Hallelujah. Through the gospel. And so Joshua 1 verse 3 says that every place which the sole of your foot will tread upon I have given you. The other things that happen at the footstool is Psalm 99 verse 5. In Psalm 99 verse 5, it says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. So this is a place. The house of God is a place for the souls of God's feet. And at the souls of, God, of God's feet, there is worship. The house of God is a place of worship, worshipping at the footstool of our God. Isn't that wonderful? And so another cross-reference there is Psalm 132, verse 7, just in brackets you can put it. But it says, go into his tabernacle and worship at his footstool. See, we go into the tabernacle, Psalm 132 and verse 7. Yep. Go into the tabernacle and worship at his footstool. One more on that now, Isaiah 60, verse 13 and 14. So Isaiah 60, verse 13 and 14 says, The glory of Lebanon shall come to you, the cypress, the pine, and the box tree together, to beautify the place of my sanctuary. And I will make the place of my feet glorious. So God is going to beautify the place of his sanctuary, his house, and he's going to make the place of his feet glorious. Hallelujah. So the glory is in there again. And by making the place of his feet glorious, it says, also then the sons of those who afflicted you shall come bowing to you. And all those who despised you shall fall prostrate at the soles of your feet. So the house of God, again, when, when God beautifies the place of his sanctuary, when God releases his glory into the house, the sons of those who were against us, the sons of those who are anti-Christ and anti the house of God will actually come bowing to you at the soles of your feet. Wow. Because the house of God is the place for the soul's of God's feet and he's walking in you you see your feet is his feet you are his feet walking on the earth every place where the sole of your foot treads upon that's where God is treading upon because God is in you because he's come to live in you you are his house wow the third aspect in Ezekiel 43 verse 7, it says that the house of God is the place where I will dwell in the midst of my people forever. So this is the place of God's dwelling. That word for dwelling is a Hebrew word, shakan. Say shakan. 
It's where the word Shekinah comes from. And this is what it means. It means to dwell, to abide, to remain, to stay, to tabernacle. It says that Mishkan, the word for tabernacle, God's place of dwelling, is derived from this word Shekinah. And that this term also refers to the tabernacle of Moses, and it's where we get the word Shekinah, the abiding presence of Almighty God. So the This house is the place of God's Shekinah. It's the place of his abiding, dwelling, glorious presence. Jesus said in Matthew 18, verse 19 and 20, he said, If two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done by my Father in heaven. See, this is the government. This is the place of God's throne. Is where two come in agreement concerning the will of God, and it is done. And then he says that if two or three of you gather together in my name, I am there in the midst of you. This is the house of God, the church of the living God, is where Jesus is in the midst of us. And it says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16 to 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16 to 18. The Apostle Paul says, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Hallelujah. So, brethren, this is the the house of God. It's the place of God's throne. It's the place of the soles of his feet. It's the place where he will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. Now back into Ezekiel 43. Because the next part of verse 7 says, Then no more shall the house of Israel defile my holy name, they nor their kings by their harlotry or with the carcasses of their kings on their high places. So when the house of God becomes this real house, he's saying that there will no more be a defiling of my holy name. You see, the name of Jesus, the name of God, has been defiled among the nations because there's, 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 been, there's been places that have been calling themselves the church, places that have been calling themselves the house of God that have actually defiled the holy name of God because the name is, is, is signifying and is synonymous with the person, the character. And so people have equated what the church has done with God. And so there's coming a day, which is now upon us, where God is building and raising up his house. His house, which is actually the place of his throne, which is the place of the soles of his feet, and the place in which he dwells forever. And when that place is fully established, no more shall they defile his holy name. And they will not commit harlotry. They will not go after something else. They will not be looking for something else. To please them. They won't be looking for smoke machines and things to help them in their worship. With the carcasses of their kings on their high places, meaning they won't be following leaders that have died a long time ago and staying true to that man's teaching without due regard to the scriptures themselves. Meaning they won't be still forming the Wesleyan Methodist Church named after John Wesley. They won't be forming the Lutheran church anymore named after Martin Luther, but they will be a part of the house that God is building for the sake of his name. His name, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. They won't be glorifying the teaching of a great leader that had come beforehand, but they'll be glorifying the word of God. And in verse 8 of Ezekiel 43, it says, When they set their threshold by my threshold and their doorpost by my doorpost, with a wall between them and me. See, this is, a, this is a, a good definition, if you like, of what happens in a denominational type of setting. We make our threshold and we, we, we set it up in what we're thinking is the house of God, but we set up our threshold and we set up our doorpost. We say, if you want to be here, you've got to come in this way, the way we want you to. Not, not the way that God says, but we want you to come in our way. We want you to wear headscarves and, 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 and all this sort of stuff and put legalistic rules on you if you're going to be a part of this. <laughs> and he says, but you put a wall between me and you. You actually divided yourself from me 
and you're building your own thing and you have not been about my house. Mm. <laughs> and they defiled my holy name by their abominations which they committed. and Therefore I have consumed them in my anger. God wants a people who worship him in spirit and in truth, in reality and by the spirit of the living God. And so, brethren, this is serious. This is actually very serious. That God is calling out a people in our day who will actually be a part of the house that God is building, that will actually hear the call and come into that rank and order and come into what God wants and be a part of the place of his throne, a part of the soles of his feet and a part of his dwelling place forever. Hallelujah. And then he says in verse 9, Now let them put their harlotry tree and the carcasses of their kings away far from me, and I will dwell in their midst forever. There needs to come a repentance. There needs to come a change. He says, let them put it away. Let them put away. The, 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 and this can be difficult for many people, but it's let them put, put their denominational background away, put their cultural Christianity background away. And then I will dwell in their midst forever because we need to be willing to move with God. We need to be his dwelling place. He's a living person. He's not a religious system. He's a person who's alive and living in you. And so he, he cannot be restrained or constrained by some man-made construct. And so God's saying, put that stuff away and then I will dwell in your midst forever. Son of man, verse 10, describe the house to the house that they may be ashamed of their iniquities. You see, God wants there to be a people now who are taking up this call that was in Ezekiel who will actually go and describe the house to the house. Tell people about the house. Tell other believers that you know of about the real house of God. Why? So that they'll be ashamed. I know that some of us, even sitting in this room, when we came into contact with this apostolic teaching, what happened? Some of us wept because we were ashamed. I can't believe I've been involved in something like what I've been involved in for so long and never realised that we weren't even building the house of God. And so God wants that to happen. He wants there to come in the people of God a sense that we're ashamed of our iniquities. Because it's actually the iniquity, it's our, it's our human bent, that human twistedness that wants to do things our way, wants to make our doorpost, our threshold. And so he says that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and then after they're ashamed, he says, let them measure the pattern. Let them measure the pattern. So God wants them to measure the pattern. And so we need to measure the pattern, we need to understand the pattern. And so... We don't have too much time to, to go into too much more, but I want to read just verse 11 to you. It says, and if they are ashamed of all that they have done. So, brethren, as you, as you begin to tell people about what the house of God really is and they become ashamed, then that means then you, the door's open now to start to build them. But if they remain unrepentant, unashamed, don't worry. Just leave them because they won't receive the rest of the pattern now. Just wait until there's that repentance. There's no point trying to tell somebody about it when they're not in a place to hear it. But it says, but if they are ashamed of all that they have done, make known to them the design of the house. Hallelujah. So God wants us to make known the design of the house. He wants us to show people what it looks like. Amen. And it's a house that has foundations. It's a house in 1 Corinthians 3.11, just to put up these references quickly. It's a house that has no other foundation than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus the Messiah, the revelation of, he, of who he is, is the foundation of the house. In Ephesians 2, verse 19 to 22, it says, We are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus the Messiah himself being the chief cornerstone. And so we need to understand that the foundation is none other than Jesus the Messiah 
and that God has laid foundation ministries of apostles and prophets to lay the foundation of Jesus the Messiah for the house of God to be built. So we need to make known that design. So that can be a stumbling block for some people already because some people are still teaching, no more apostles, no more prophets today. And yet this is the foundation of the building of the house. And so we need to make known what it looks like, that Jesus the Messiah then is the chief cornerstone, that we are living stones being built into that chief cornerstone to be built up a spiritual house, to be a holy temple in the Lord, to be a dwelling place for God in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Then it says we need to make known its arrangement. So there's an arranging that happens. And so if we make this number one, that number I or something, make known to them the design of the house, and then two I's, or A, B, yeah, A is good. And then B is to make known its arrangement. And so in Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 13, it says that Christ in his ascension gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? To arrange them, to perfect the saints. And that word perfect, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, that word perfect means to arrange, to prepare, to set in order. And so this house that Jesus is building has five ministries that are arranging his house the way he wants it. Hallelujah. And then it says that number three now, or C, it says that we need to make known its exits and its entrances. Let's put just John 10 verse 7 to 9. talks about the good shepherd. And it says that he said, I am the door. And you can come in through me and be saved. And Seven to nine. You can come in through me and be saved and you can come in and go out. You can come in and find pasture and go out. So we're to go in to find pasture. What's that talking about? We need to be fed. We need to be trained. We need to be discipled. So the discipling happens in the house of God. That's our entrance. We come in through the door, Jesus. We come in through the right foundational ways. Then we get built up. We get trained. We get equipped. And then we get sent out the exit. (laughs) So that we can be sons now planted in the world, growing up and bringing up more. Yes, hallelujah. You can even put Isaiah 2 verse 3 and 4 in there as well because we go up to the mountain of the house of the God of Jacob and in that house we get taught his ways and we learn how to walk in his paths. And then then the law goes forth, we go through the exit and we go proclaiming the word. So we need to come in, get taught his ways, learn his paths then go forth with the law, with the with the law, the Torah, the instruction, the teaching, and the result of that is the nations will stop warring with each other. Hallelujah. Then number f- number four, just quickly, we need to make known its entire design. Just put Acts twenty twenty seven. This is making known the whole counsel of God. We need to make known the entire design, And that's actually coming to know then the eternal purpose of God, the defeat of all the principalities and powers, the glory covering the earth. Hallelujah. Then the fifth one, or E, is that we need to make known all its ordinances, all its forms, and all its laws. In other words, we need to know how to conduct ourselves in the house of God. Ordinances, forms, and laws. And so put 1 Timothy 3.15 that we ought to know how to conduct ourselves in the house of God. And this is actually learning how to walk in the new man, putting on the new man, not responding out of our old nature, but starting to respond out of Christ in us, in all of our relationships, having sound doctrine, learning how to honour the older women and older men and how to treat the younger women and younger men as brothers and sisters and having the right relationships together in our families. It's conducting ourselves in the house of God. And then the final thing, F, is we need to write it down in their sight so that they may keep its whole design and all its ordinances and perform them. So then we need to write it down. We need to, in other words, make it plain so that people can keep it, so that people can keep the whole pattern of the house of God. And so the final verses then to finish on is John 14. John 14, 
this. Let me see here. I'll just do verse 23. I was going to read a bit more, but we don't have time. Let's just read verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. You see, we need to write it down in their sight so that people can keep it. So Jesus said, if anyone loves me, they will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. The house of God. We need to describe the house to the house of Israel, the people of God, so that they can be ashamed of their iniquities and so that they can measure the pattern.